So four grammar or four letters are taught to be Yahweh, the four letter, letters of God. Yeah, you take both. However, when you dig a little deeper in the epidemiology of the word grammaton, it ha has actually a deeper root. And that root is four tetra, you know, tetra, which is tetrahedron. Grammaton uh, comes from the word gram or gravity. Weight, you know, it, it's, it refers to weight, gram, and effect, the effect of gravity. And that's where the word gravity came from, grammaton. <laughs> so now you have a word for God, okay, that has the structure of a tetrahedron generating a gravitational effect. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, that I'm pushing it, right? I'm sure, you know, I mean, this is kind of wild. But hey, then I look up what the heck is the tetragrammaton in Kabbalistic tradition, and I found that it is an isotropic vector metric in 2D. Here is typically in uh, Kabbalistic tradition the way God is represented. It's represented as uh, isotropic vector metric. Remember, four faces, three, two, one. It's like one face of the isotropic vector metric. And each letter of the word God has a number that goes with it. In Kabbalistic tradition, that's very important. Now you gotta realize that the Kabbalistic tradition or the oral tradition of the Jewish uh, uh, history. These traditions were not to be written. They were not even supposed to be talked about. Only initiates could learn about these knowledge. It was thought to be the nature of God that was revealed. And if you understood it, you could understand God. So I was thinking maybe the Kabbalistic tradition is the explanation of what the power source inside that box is, that bright object. Go ahead. I want to also mention I'm a, I'm a student of Kabbalah. And yes. Uh, Yud means yeah. singularity. That's right. And the center of the of the of the Kabbalistic tradition is that crown that unfolds onto itself to infinity, describing singularity. So I was puzzled with this. I found that the that the tetragrammaton, right, was actually generating the numbers. So each letter in the isotropic vector matrix is a number. And the Kabbalistic tradition tells you that the numbers are just as important as the letters. And so when you calculate the numbers, you get 72, which is the 72 names of God that's found in the Bible, and the 72 faces of God, right? So that will match. But this is a male God. We're missing half the equation again. Why is it that in many of these ancient civilizations, some of them we didn't have time to see today, we only have half of the code? Well, that would be because if you were an advanced civilization trying to put a code, embed a code in a not so advanced uh, planetary system, you wouldn't want these people to be able to uncode or decode that code prior to being ready for that type of power. So you could code the code, or you could make the code, only one polarity of it, like the male polarity of the code. 
And it wouldn't be until, until that civilization understood the balance between the male and female, understood the equali equality between the male and female, that they would be able to decode the code. And then that would mean that they were ready to do it. You guys follow what I just said? So basically, here you have to add the female god or goddess to the tetrahedron or to the isotropic vector metric. And if you did, you have the double of these numbers. And the result would be 72 plus 72 given 144, which is thought to be the, n the number of ascension in the um, in Revelation. As well in Revelation it says that the New Jerusalem is a crystal city with rainbows all around it. And that that crystal city has faces of 144. There is exactly 144 faces on the outside of a 64 tetrahedron metric. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I thought I was on to it. And so I kept on reading the Bible and I I got really interested now, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh my god, this is all about the technology." This is all about Atlantis. And I, um, I kept on reading, and I found something that was extremely significant. And this has been completely omitted by scholars. This is long after, you know Moses was following the ark through the, through the, through the desert. It took him 40 years to do a route that usually took only a year, okay? I know this because my father, actually my grandfather, uh, I, my father is Iranian, and my grandfather was a guide that brought people to Mecca from Iran. And it took him six months there and six months back in the desert. And so these routes were well known. And um, actually my grandfather lived to the age of 128. And uh, I believe that it's because he went to Mecca, to the Kaaba, which held the black crystal, the dark stone, or the black sun as described by the Sumerian plates, given to man by the sun gods. But in any case, Moses is taking 40 years to, take a, to do a route that should have taken a year. Why? Because he's following the ark. It's very clear in the Judaic tradition and in the rabbinic tradition that the ark is moving on its own. On its own. Whenever the ark lifts and starts going, they would lift camp and follow it. And whenever the ark would stop, they would stop and put the camp up. Sometimes they would stay there for three, four years before the ark would start going again. So this ark will seem to have anti-gravitic capability. It seemed to be able to hover. There's instances where they describe the ark lifting the high priest that carried it. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about all this and then eventually, you know, Moses dies and um, and Joshua is, has taken the lead. And Joshua arrives at the Jordan. And this is where I found this really interesting thing. Joshua arrives at the Jordan and the Jordan is running at flood level. There's no way they can cross with the tribes of Israel. And they're trying to get to Jericho on the other side. So Joshua doesn't know what to do and he asks God, and God says,
Um, uh, now, now, this is describing the high priest taking the ark and going into the water of the Jordan with the ark. And as soon as they put their feet in the Jordan with the ark, the waters are cut up. Okay? And then it says, you know, and then there's a whole bunch of other things. This is Jordan, uh, Joshua 4.22, for people that want to refer it. And the priests came up out of the river, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner they had set their feet on dry ground, than the water of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at